Thanks for joining us. This is live with Miami Community News, and our guest today is J.D. Suarez, MD. All right, yes. and nice, nice seeing you again. Nice. Seeing and we you. want to say hello to our studio audience over there. So, tell us about your new position and and the new uh, hospital. So, I'm the chief medical officer at Coralty Hospital, Miami, mm -hmm. and it's it's um, an old hospital, but it's actually a new hospital yes. in a way because it was recently bought out by a global healthcare company. Uh, called Coralty. In the rest of the world, they operate under the name of Sanitas. Um, so whenever you see Sanitas clinics, um, if you go to South America, Spain. Uh, seven countries. Yes, seven countries. Right. Uh, they're all over the world. And they're just starting in the United States. So they have about uh, 34 clinics here in Florida. And this is the first hospital that they purchased. So the first hospital um, that was acquired by uh, Coralty was Westchester Hospital, the old Westchester General That's Hospital. That's a Coralway and a Coralway. Uh, right off the expressway to the east Correct. side. Owned, right owned by 26. the Fox family for, for a generation or two. Yes. Right? And they have family members in the medical arena. Yes. So it's been around since the 60s. Um, and you, you're right. The Fox family owned the hospital. It was a small community hospital, 125 beds. And now we're trying to rebrand it. We're, you know, making it uh, brand spanking new with a, a lot of new equipment and physicians. So, Doctor, previously that was known as the osteopathic hospital. Correct. I don't. When was that? And what what is it in the last ten years? What it looked like, and what looking forward, what does it look like? So you're right. It was. It's actually one of the oldest osteopathic teaching hospitals in the state of Florida. So it has a family practice residency program. Um, so it's a teaching hospital. And recently, the MDs and the DOs had to merge, and they call that the single accreditation system. And Say that again? The two agencies? Yes. So the AOA. Oh, no, they used to be uh, yes, opponents, if you not will. Not anymore. So, uh, and I actually, I was hired to, because I was into medical education, or I am into medical education. Um, I was hired to, to, to uh, do that single accreditation. Uh, program. So now we're in MDDO. Um, it's ACGME accredited. So we're accredited by uh, a governing body that uh, accredits teaching hospitals. You know, old habits and old thoughts are, are die hard, if you will. Yes. And so here it is, 2021. I'm making reference to the way it was in the 60s and 70s and yes. 80s and the way that, that I knew that. Now, is physically, the, the hospitals are almost 80,000 square feet mm -hmm. currently. Big parking lot, right? And lots yes. of undeveloped land. Yes. Right. And just so the folks know that this organization that bought, purchased this company, it's all encompassing. Correct me if, if I'm wrong. They sell health care insurance. Yes. In other parts of the world. In yes. other parts of the world. They, uh, it's a t they also have a university where they yes. teach people in the medical arena. Yes. So maybe they'll so go they have a med the, Yes. Sunnizas has a medical school. Right. A medical school. Yes. Medi a medical school and they train no, health care professionals. Yes. And then they also sell health care equipment. Correct. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. So all those resources get brought down here to, to us in Miami. Yeah. So worldwide, they have about 5 million patients, uh, plus 5 million. So that's a lot. Globally. 5 million patients per? In, in the entire world. Okay, gotcha. Okay. So they service, they take care of 5 million patients. That That is amazing. Yeah. All right. And we, we know that, that lots of folks move here for a lot of reasons, but why do they come to Miami? Well, b uh, basically, they want to bring the model that they that started out in Europe and in South America, and they felt that, you know, one of the biggest issues that we have in the United States is having strong primary care, and that's their focus, primary care, families, and it's actually the model that we follow as a family physician. I'm a board-certified family doctor, so it makes sense. This is a small community hospital, and that's basically what they want. They want to uh, strengthen community hospitals, strengthen primary care. We have over 300,000 patients in Florida. That is amazing. Yeah. By the way, Dr. Tina Carroll Scott, you might know her. She runs the pediatric clinic over here in South Miami. And she's committed to helping form community and form families and keep those families together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to be in the health care uh, arena and it, it was, and I worked at Jackson, and to see how their agencies to try to keep these families together, yes. and where they can help each other in, in good healthcare practices. And so I'm I'm happy that there's an, another agent, another organization down here that can help 
create that community because we all want to be part of something. So, uh, so the company purchased Westchester uh, almost a year ago. Yes, and October twenty twenty. Right in the middle of this, um, I know. Right in the middle, and and it, it, it's it's sort of hard to look back in this last year and a half, and and we frequently get the years wrong. All right, I know. So what what does it look like in the next year or two? What's going to be taking place at at your hospital? So we're rebranding, and you're right. One of the one of the uh, biggest issues has been the this pandemic. You know, COVID. Um, it's basically occupied all our time. Um, it's front and center. Things are slow. Um, even ordering equipment takes a really long time. And it's not just us, it's everybody in the industry. Um, you know, supply chains have been difficult. Uh, but with all those challenges, we're doing a lot of great things at the hospital. I think that the hospital is really um, transforming itself. We're going to rebrand from top to bottom. It's going to look like a totally different hospital. We're going to update everything. Uh, equipment, personnel, staff, we're keeping a lot of, you know, our core um, uh, pay, uh, staff members that we have and, you know, just adding different lines of services. Approximately how many employees are there? We have about 600 employees. That work out of that facility. There. Yes. Now, if I remember right, there's, there is a healthcare product uh, next door. Is that a nursing home that's nearby? Yeah. So right across the street, uh, there's West Gables. Um, that used to be owned by the family, but now that's it's two two totally different um, organizations. Okay, so you brought up about COVID. Uh, COVID's on our mind. By the way, folks, this is a piece of glass between us. I've been triple vaccinated at this point, and uh, it's a and piece I've of glass. Been vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> so and I believe everybody should get vaccinated. <laughs> right. So let so let's talk about what the hospital, what the medical community is doing about COVID right now. We are doing so many things. For uh, with COVID. I think that, you know, it's been a challenge for all of us. We have a, a really good team uh, to address um, uh, the issues with COVID. Uh, but one of the biggest things that we're proud of are, are the um, treatments with monoclonal antibodies, uh, Regeneron. And uh, patients are coming in. We're preventing admissions. Um, you know that 70% of the people that get Regeneron that qualify for Regeneron actually prevent hospitalization and even dying. So the statistics are amazing. When you say qualified, what does that mean? Okay, so if you have been exposed now, now if you're unvaccinated and have been exposed to COVID and you know close contact, um, you can get post-COVID um, uh, treatment prophylactically. Um, if you are positive and you know you have, uh, you're overweight, you have one of you know comorbidities, but right now, um, many patients do qualify, you know, for, for, for the Regeneron. So, so if you have symptoms, right, you can go over to the hospital mm -hmm. and get treated. You get treated like in the, on, on the floor? The no, no. Well, so we it? basically, so what we did was we created a, um, an area, a special area in the hospital, and we basically bring patients in and we give them uh, treatments. So we do IV infusions. We're seeing a lot. We're actually, uh, last week we did about like 50, 60 patients. The doctor says when people go in, they get the IV. When the IV gets done, how long is that treatment? So the whole process may take about an hour and a half to two hours, probably less. Um, and then what, they get it and then you go, okay, now what? What happens then? So they get to treatment and then they basically, once they're finished, they can go home. Of course, you have to be stable. You have to, you can't be desaturating your saturation, like your oxygen in your body can't be very low. This is to prevent admissions. So it's not like you're so sick that you're going to get this and then get admitted to the hospital. This is totally to prevent you from getting really sick. So we're not looking at patients at the tail end. We're looking at patients in the beginning phases to moderate, mild to moderate, to prevent hospitalization. So before Regeneron, people would go to the hospital and they might get admitted. They would get admitted. Is that right? Yeah. If you if you met criteria, you right. couldn't admit. If you basically just had the sniffles and a cold and a cough, we would just send you home and you'd get monitored and you'd be treated. I mean, most of the patients were treated outpatient. Um, if you met criteria, then you would get admitted. But so yes, we... 
we are preventing hundreds of patients from getting admitted thanks to Regenera. Thanks and, to that. And when when and not a lot of hospitals are doing it. Yeah. When when you do that, you save their family and the community a lot of grief. I mean, yes. it's untold. I don't know how many people it affects, but it, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens per person that that has that. One of the things I, I was out to dinner last night, and there were six of us, and half had had COVID, and half were vac had been vaccinated. Right. The misperception I think a lot of us had was I've got I've got the vaccine, so I'm not going to get it. But when you look back, it was the, the function of it was to prevent serious illness or death. Exactly. Not to stop you from getting it. Correct. But stop you from getting really sick. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, I certainly have seen more people in the last six weeks that have gotten it than for me in the prior year. Why is that? The this variant, the Delta variant, is very contagious, um, just like chickenpox. I mean, basically, um, you get exposed to it, and it's it's like wildfire. It's it's crazy, and you're right. I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of patients infected, much more than in, in the beginning. Um, I mean, my view is a little skewed. I'm looking at very sick patients that are coming in, and also <clears throat> elderly patients that are a uh, you know that have been vaccinated that get it but those patients are not being admitted remember this is like the pandemic of the unvaccinated patients more than 90 percent of the people that end up in the hospital are vaccinated very 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 few vaccinated are admitted so i was speaking to a friend of ours text a few months ago and he said michael i have covid he said it's the disease and loneliness michael he said, if I'm too, if I'm really sick, I go to the hospital, family can't come in. <clears throat> and if I'm home, I'm afraid I'm gonna give it to my caregivers. Right. And if you could cry over Texas, that's what that conversation looked like for a long time. And when you, you look at it, is right now are hospitals allowing family members to go visit their COVID sick patients, friend, uh, family? A lot of the hospitals are going back to the way it was. They did open up to, you know, for visitors, but not anymore. Um, we we don't have a visitation policy right now, and it's to protect the staff and to protect our patients that are negative. Okay. So people do want to know why somewhere between the figures I've heard, 30 to 45 percent of nurses in hospitals are not vaccinated. Right. That's a figure that I've heard. What is it? The has and policemen's around 30 percent. Same with firemen. All right. So what is it overall? What's the 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 rationale for them in not taking this vaccination? Well, um, I mean, it varies. We're lucky at the hospital that we have a very high vaccination rate. Uh, we've had a lot of campaigns at the hospital educating. I think it's it, you have to really educate the staff. And sometimes, you know, I, I never forget when I, I, I do residency and, and in the beginning of my training, you would work with nurses and doctors that know that smoking is bad for them. or They go oh, out and point. smoke. And the same thing happens with, with COVID. I think there's a certain fear and lack of knowledge um, and sort of like, this is gonna happen to you, but not to me. Um, it's unfortunate that sometimes when they do get the COVID, they're like, I wish I would have gotten vaccinated. There, there's somebody I know, she kept putting off getting the vaccine, the shot. And so finally she, I would send her the headlines. And I said, are you ready? So she says, okay, I have an appointment for the 30th. I'm going now. Uh, she's gonna she's gonna get out of it. I said, if you want your shot tomorrow, you tell me, and I'll help you get that. Okay. So finally, she gets her first shot just last week, and I said, what was your hesitation? I'm afraid of needles. And I'm thinking with all the things, you know, how do you get you, your cavities done, right? right? But it doesn't. That fear was there. Another gentleman, 55, African American. He said he wanted shots. I set up an appointment. He lied to me that he went because I asked him, when's your next appointment? He said they're gonna call him. I said, get over here. And then finally, it took his mother. He lives with his mother, who's 80, right? It was the sister. Finally, it took the three of them together to have a unified voice and strength to be able to go there because they were afraid of whatever it happened to be. So we understand that that everybody has their own reasons for getting it and their own reasons for not right. getting it. When the FDA comes back this week and approves a, uh, fully, you know, fully vetted, it's all good. Is that going to have a significant impact for those people I, that were hesitant? You know, I think that it, it can. Um, this, the group of people that don't want to get vaccinated, it's interesting. It's, it's, you know, 
multifactorial why they don't get it. And I think there are a group that say, well, it's not approved by the FDA. Why, you know, I'm not going to get I know, it. Except for the 200 million people, <laughs> maybe 500 million across the world that have gotten it. Right, 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 right. So let's talk about the, for the folks that are, that are at the hospital because they're unvaccinated, and there's some that have been vaccinated, that are sick, taking up bed space, taking up doctor's times and nurses' times. There are patients that are not able to go to the hospital and get their, their, pre, uh, their surgery that they were scheduled to get. Something that gets put off for a while, a couple yes, months, right? Yes, yes, yes. That is a terrible imposition on the people that have said, I want to take care of myself, right? And I have a friend who's supposed to get a hip operation. It was set up in July. It was supposed to be September 11th. They moved it to November. Right. So here's this lady, terrible arthritis, can barely move, right? And she has to, to you know, tough it out. Right. So I, no, and can cancer patients, you know, that, that are putting off their surgeries thinking if i come to the hospital you know maybe i'll get COVID. we so basically you have to make that decision and stop like your elective surgery um if you feel that you you know that it's getting out of control at the hospital we actually we're functioning well i think that our you know our well i know that our supplies are doing well we've been we're managing the entire situation we're like veterans at this already it's We've had like a practice run for 18 months, you know, a year and a half of COVID. Um, so I think we're pretty sharp and we have been able to control our numbers. And, and what type of surgeries have, are you able to do? Put aside the pandemic right now, uh, able to do. And what, what type of procedures will you be doing? Well, we're, we're doing all the types of procedures, orthopedics, urology, you know, hernia repairs, your, you know, bread and butter sort of surgeries. We're a community hospital, so we don't do very sophisticated um, surgeries, but basically 90% of all surgical procedures that are, that are done uh, around the country. Um, the, putting it off can be so complicated, compl complicating to the patient because diseases get worse, you know, so um, we understand that. And to just hold surgeries for two years, that's a lot. Yes. And yeah. cancer continues. The cancer and, continues and, and things continue. Yeah. All right. So, um, and patients can go to that hospital and get diagnosed for different diseases. Yes. Right? And what's that look like? If somebody says, you know, it's a local hospital, I don't want to go to this, a giant hospital, it's too intimidating, I don't want to drive downtown, I want to go to the hospital that's nearby. Right. And so, they need it. Their doctor needs to be able to the, who, pra who practices there. Is that usually how that's done? Yes. So we're 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 not open to nine one one. So basically, um, you can come in through our ER. We, our ER is open, um, and patients come in. Um, we see a lot of people in communities. It's like a family f feeling. We are very close with our patients. It's like having your family doctor taking care of you. All our mostly all our primary care physicians are family docs that have offices bring their patients in and we make you feel like you're with family i think that that's like the biggest difference we're not this huge mammoth 2000 bed hospital um you could i mean the er calls me and i go over there to resolve problems and family members come in and say hey can you take care of this for me so it's it's very very tight i have a friend who's a um um, nurse practitioner. So she was a traveling nurse practitioner. So she winds up in Washington state way out in the boonies. And she had this little house and she would have the, she was like the triage nurse. They would right. go there and she'd treat whoever could treat. And if they needed to go to the hospital, all right, come on. And they would walk like next door and they would go to the small hospital where the people in the area were really comfortable. Right. And if they needed something big, they would go send them to exactly. the nearest big hospital. Exactly. And, and that's what you guys do. And that's the model. Yes. And and that's when people used to condemn, you know, Jackson Hospital 15 years ago. I said, if you need a heart transplant, you're going to go there. Right? Right. You're not going to your local hospital. What do you mean? I go, come on. And so we recognize there's a di different levels of, of ability to fulfill exactly. the need. Exactly. And so with the organization, the company that, that purchased Westchester, it has mammoth assets, mammoth resources known worldwide, right? And how many uh, employees are there at the company? So there's thousands of employees worldwide. Um, I mean, in our hospital, 
there's about 600, but yep. there's thousands yes. throughout the world. Pretty big organization. It's right? huge. And I'm, we're, we're glad that you, that you came to Miami because when we see that, it makes everybody do better. And right. so we're the patients, all right? We benefit from that. Uh, hopefully everybody can provide the services needed and more options, and I think that's what people want. Right. So as, as you look down the road, what does medicine, delivering medicine look like in the next five to 10 years? I think, I think the biggest um, challenge or, th or I think the biggest thing that we really need to work on is strengthening primary care, preventing diseases, making you feel better so things don't get out of hand. And I think creating that family, you know, the family home, uh, patient-centered care, um, where we take care of families, not just like a, a disease or an organ. I think that that's our model and Sanitas and Coralty, that's where, you know, that's where we're going and that's what we've been doing for many, many, many years. And I think that that's the most important because then it becomes too ultra specialized. Now, if you need ultra specialization, absolutely, 100%. But let's start preventing diseases and trying to, you know, live longer, healthier. 25 years ago, we'd, quality. Start, we'd start hearing this wellness. Right. You know, what is wellness, all right? It's more than just the absence of ill health. It's this, this whole generational thing where everybody's being taken care of. Whenever I watch Andy and Mayberry, you know, with the oak line trees, right. there's a doc over there and there's the, you know, the, the shoe repair guy. That certainly, you know, it warms my heart when, right. when, when we see that. And there's a whole lot of people that don't know that that can really exist, all right? And, you know, perhaps you're able to do that uh, in, in, the, in this area. Some of the hospitals are opening up branch offices to try to go out into the community Correct. so that people can walk there or, or a short drive. Uh, do you think that that's something that the hospital in Miami might start doing? Well, right now we're focusing on strengthening our community and our surrounding community. We do have clinics throughout. Um, so here we are in the center. Uh, so we're on Coral Way and it's like right in the heart of Miami. And we have clinics that, and patients, this is the population that we want. Yes. You know, this is our, our geographic demographic area. And then the idea is, you know, to try to uh, have more of these systems and networks throughout the entire country. So we, we understand that there's a culture in each of the areas, whether it's mm -hmm. African American or Hispanic or Venezuelan or Nicaraguan or Jewish, whatever. And so when we when we when we look at that, it's that comfort level that keeps people going back. There's the old story about one of the big healthcare insurance companies got was sold uh, from I don't know about a half a billion dollars years ago, and they mm -hmm. took out the cafecita and they took out the little uh, whatever whatever right. games are played. Guess what? Right. They lost a lot of patients. Because right. the culture was, you're going to come down, you're going to spend the day, you're going to see the people you see once a month, all right? And then you're going to visit the doctor too, right. right? And they made a real cultural experience about it. I've been in a couple of the clinics where I've watched how it is. It's a socialization process yes. where they can go and they can feel comfortable. They're not anxious anymore. And they can all, we can all talk about what ails us, right? Right. And, uh, and that's therapeutic. Yes, absolutely. That's very therapeutic. Yes. And, you know, we're social animals. We're, we're, we need each other. And I think that the pandemic has messed that up, but in every culture, when you have that, and if that's the model that that you have in healthcare, I think it's I think it's great. Let's talk about the advantages and the and the, the bad parts of of um, of uh, telephonic, if that's the term, healthcare, where you go get your follow up with the, on on your phone. What's that? What are some good things about it? And some not so good things. So some of the good things is that it does open up access. Um, and you can't see a doctor right away. The, you know, and it depends if you have, if you're an older patient, um, you may want that because you're used to seeing your doctor face to face. You're touching, you know, the physician, the patient, the doctor is examining you. Um, and that's some of the, the pitfalls. For example, could you really see that rash real well? You know, is the lighting good in that patient's house? Uh, can you, you know, can you palpate the lymph nodes? Um, so th those are some of the disadvantages. So but in some cases, if it's just something, a run, uh, some, like if the acuity level, the problem that the patient has is not that high, 
then yeah, I think it works. But there are you do need that touch. You I'm need, one of those. You, guys. You, you need to examine the patient. So I, well, years ago, I go to the doctor and say, "What's going on?" And you know, he said, "Lie down." As soon as he touched me, he put his hand on my shoulder. I don't know. And you know what? I just wanted somebody to talk to. Right. I just wanted him to do the magic touch. All right. And he runs all these. He says, "You're fine." He says, "Stop drinking the coffee." And so, <laughs> so when you look at that, there are groups of people that w want on, on the phone, all right? Uh, but I do think there's an advantage of being able to look at somebody and they're just saying, look at them and see how they're behaving. You know, do they have this little spot on them, right? right? What's, you know, what's going on with them? Sometimes during the exam, I, I don't know how many times I've had patients that come in for one thing, for one thing, and then I actually discover something else. I, I, I you know, malignant melanoma comes to mind. I don't know how many patients I've had that I'm examining them. They come in for sinusitis or something else, and I notice a lesion, and it's like, whoa, you got to take care of that. So there's and a, you miss that yes. with the telemedicine. A absolutely. And and uh, so I, I, one of my uh, doctors, he said, well, three days a week he's on the phone. So he only takes appointments on Monday and Friday, and he's, he's busy, busy, busy. I said, you know, that's not what I'm looking for. Right. I just, you know. I just want to say I went to the doctor, right? And you can see how if if you're in denial about certain things and you call your doctor, everything is fine instead of him looking at you, right? right. And um, I used to run a lot. And one day I was out at the at an airport talking to some pilots, and I see this tall, lanky guy with 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 brand new running shoes. So I started talking about marathons. I knew he was a runner, right? right. Not just because of shoes, but the way that he looked, right? right. And so we ha and if I would if that would have been on the phone, all right, right. I wouldn't have been able to exactly. see it. So there's lots of reasons for uh, for e for each of those. And um, uh, again, so if somebody has some COVID sy symptoms, all right, they can walk over, go, go to your hospital, yes, right, and they you have a room. And we're doing the Regeneron, okay, which is uh, it's gotten it took a while for it to get the publicity. I know the state uh, recently said they purchased three hundred thousand yes um, doses, if you will, put, put around. Of the state, and that is to prevent people from going to get sick enough to where they have to go in the exactly. hospital. Exactly. Any prediction about when the hospitalization is going to stabilize? I'm just going to give you some stats. Yep. Um, you know, not my opinion, just the stats. Right. Uh, so supposedly this variant, um, basically, you know, it's fast, hits you fast, um, and we're looking at a peak probably the first week of September, where it's, the numbers are going to peak on that day. Um, they're looking at September 1st. But within the next 30 to 60 days, it, we should see a dramatic decrease. I, you know, I'm hoping that that's the way. So basically, the Delta variant peaks fast, but it also goes down fast. So what, the group that was with us that I did talk to people, they, they had symptoms of from two to six days where they to go, there's something wrong, right? Right. It, are, it, and as you're saying, it goes up and then it goes away pretty pretty quickly. Well, well I'm, I'm talking the, the numbers of patients. Yeah, yes. I'm not, I'm not talking the disease yeah. process, not that the patients get sick right away and get better right away. It's not, uh, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, is that the population, it goes up and then it goes down fast. Um, for example, COVID, lingered for a while you know the alpha variant just lingered and it just kept and it took months and months and months for this to go away and that's what we're, and we're taking statistics that happen in india and other countries right. that have been faced with delta variant unfortunately at least for me i uh, uh, the value of human life seems to have d disappeared when i look at the numbers and you go, oh my goodness, we had lost fifty thousand people, soldiers in the in Vietnam War, and it was I terrible. Know. You know, and you fifty two thousand people. Oh my goodness! Now we're looking at, in the state. There's thirty eight thousand. Forty thousand people died in Florida. Yeah, forty, almost forty thousand. And it, and it's like, oh my goodness. And we just, oh well, they died during COVID. Oh, and and I hope that our sanity gets gets brought back. I know mental health issues, social issues are the, are, are gigantic right now. Uh, People I hear from around seventy percent of people are having some anxiety about it. I think it's probably just about everybody if they if they were true to themselves. Doctor, thank you very much for thank being here. Thank you very here. much. And I, I, again, our guest is uh, 
J.D. Suarez, M.D., over at the new hospital. The name of the hospital, again, is? Karazzi Hospital, Miami. Great. Wonderful. Thank you for being here, and thanks for thank caring you. about the community. Thank you. And thank you for our studio audience. And, Howard, thank you for being here. Folks, again, thank you for your, for your time, and we appreciate it. Have a good day.